Hey, True Crimers, this episode is proudly sponsored by Best Fiends. If you're looking for a new game that can challenge your mind and imagination, then you've got to check out the top-rated mobile puzzle adventure game called Best Fiends. If you haven't played this game yet, seriously, what are you waiting for? Download it today. You can thank me later. For those of you new to the game, I've got a couple of helpful tips to get you started. Each level has objective goals with the recommended characters called Fiends. When you match and earn multiple tiles, some Fiends help you with converter blocks, the funky little pentagons with arrows on them. Converter blocks turn all of the surrounding blocks the same color when they're activated, so they are especially helpful on levels with color objectives. One of the things I love most about Best Fiends is that you don't need the internet to play once you have downloaded it. You can literally play this game in the middle of nowhere, and I mean that. Whether you're out in the country with absolutely no signal or flying the friendly skies at 30,000 feet, Best Fiends is your first choice for fun yet challenging entertainment. They're always adding new levels, so I'm always learning new tricks every single time I play. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now, on with the show. The views expressed in the following episode are those of the subjects interviewed or individual presenters from the case. They do not necessarily reflect the views of Reach Freaks LLC or the Invisible Choir podcast. This episode also contains vulgar language. Listener discretion is advised. Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. New England is filled with quaint historical cities, paved with cobblestone sidewalks that don't often get the glory that, say, your Boston's or New Haven's might. That's because, to most, these areas are past their, quote, heyday, having thrived and reached their peaks during the textile industries of the late 19th century. Be that as it may, very few cities in this region of the country can boast to have been prosperous even before that time. New Bedford, otherwise known as the Whaling City, is a Massachusetts fishing town that became known as one of the largest whaling ports in the world. At the peak of the whaling industry, the New Bedford Harbor docked 329 vessels, worth an astounding $12 million in 1857. It was during this time that New Bedford was named the richest city per capita in the entire world. As the collapse of both the whaling and textile industries were inevitable, New Bedford has faced its fair share of hardships throughout history. The city has managed, however, to remain a major player in the fishing industry. In 2020, New Bedford was named the number one fishing port in America when determining the dollar value per catch. In 2015, a whopping $322 million was brought in off the New Bedford ships, with scallops being the main contribution to their success. Yet, even with New Bedford's unique stranglehold on this niche market, the city still faced adversity in regards to crime and violence. 20% of the coastal city's residents live below the poverty line, and since the year 2000, there have been an estimated 30 unsolved homicides in the region. Let's face it, you have to be tough to live in a place like New Bedford. If you're going to work, you're most likely working with your hands. This isn't Silicon Valley, and there are no tech jobs here. It's the kind of place where if you're from New Bedford, you're proud to be from New Bedford. And if you're a tourist, well, you might have kept driving past the exit until reaching the more popular and desirable beaches of Cape Cod. If you happen to grow up in this East Coast city, you've most likely seen, heard of, or even experienced violence in some capacity at one point or another. You may have even been in a fistfight or two if you attended New Bedford High or the neighboring Vogue Tech. But when a city's residents are seemingly impervious to the notion of violence, it takes a lot to shock them or to even raise an eyebrow. It takes something so horrific that not even the hard-nosed residents of a place like New Bedford, Massachusetts could ignore, let alone stomach. What happened during the late hours of February 1st, 2006, and that dreadfully carried over into the next several days, would rattle this small ocean town like nothing ever had before. This is the story of a confused outcast, of an 18-year-old lone wolf fueled by hate, bigotry, and violence. The night he decided to turn his warped ideologies into a reality, he'd not only leave several deep physical scars to the skin of his victims, but deeply profound proverbial wounds as well. When Jacob Robita viciously cut into the lifeblood of the blue-collar neighborhood that is New Bedford, leaving his mark like an infected lesion. Most were unsure if it would ever heal, yet certain that it would forever remain. <laughs> Puzzles Lounge was a small New Bedford pub located at 426 North Front Street in the city's north end. It was known as one of only two gay bars in town, a modest neighborhood tavern where regulars would gather after a long day of work, to socialize over a beer, shoot some pool, and maybe play the Massachusetts State Lottery game Keno. The atmosphere inside of Puzzles was similar to any other local watering hole you might find on the south coast of Massachusetts. Cheap, strong drinks, a jukebox that would get you four songs for a dollar, and an outdated plastic bar sign that dimly illuminated the words, Puzzles, the hottest nightclub in town, as you walked off the chipped and cracked sidewalk through the front door. 
The only difference between this bar and any other hole in the wall New England pub is that Puzzles just happened to be a gay bar. Everyone knew one another at Puzzles. The atmosphere was friendly and inviting. But unlike other bars, there never seemed to be any problems at Puzzles. The New Bedford police had openly expressed to locals that they wished other bars in the city were more like the North Front Street establishment, referring to the overall lack of drama, fights, or general need for police presence that some of the city's other late-night spots had a reputation for. Though the North End was not the nicest part of town and still had ongoing gang activity within the neighborhood, the patrons of Puzzles mostly kept to themselves. 53-year-old Robert Perry was one of the regulars, a paramedic supervisor for Mercy Health in Boston, Mass. Perry had only been out publicly in the gay community for about four to six weeks, having struggled with his sexual identity for the vast majority of his adult life. Robert, or Bob, as the guys at Puzzles knew him, had been married for several years. He was a father of four boys and had led the life of a heterosexual male for most of his marriage with his wife, Lauren. Perry would eventually come out to his wife revealing the secret truth to her, that he was in fact a gay man. And though it was certainly a confusing time in both Bob and Lauren's lives, not only did they remain friends, they managed to become closer than they ever had been in the past. The honesty that Bob shared with his wife only strengthened their bond. Truly, one of the most difficult things Lauren could ever imagine to have heard was that her husband of many years was gay. But she loved Bob, no matter what. If this is what he needed to do in order to be his true self and to be happy, she was inevitably supportive of the man she had grown and spent so many years of her life with. Bob Perry had felt like a new man, like a tremendous weight had been lifted off his shoulders. No more secrets buried deep inside, no more hiding his true identity. And the bar staff and clientele of Puzzles welcomed Bob with open arms, just as they had when anyone walked through their doors, regardless of their gender, race, or sexual orientation. Puzzles truly was a jovial and judgment-free zone. That's exactly how bartender Philip Daggett would welcome a different man the evening of February 2nd, 2006, when an unfamiliar face strolled into the pub just past midnight. Although unfamiliar to the men that frequented the bar so often, the stranger dressed in all black baggy clothes and was greeted with subtle head nods and casual smiles. No one had thought much of it. The stocky young man looked around, canvassing the room upon entry. He then proceeded to the bar top, where he immediately asked bartender Philip Daggett, Hey, is this a gay bar? Philip responded politely that yes, it was indeed a gay bar, and asked the man if he had perhaps been looking for the other gay bar in the city called La Place, which was more commonly known in town as the quote, lesbian bar. The man responded back with, No, this is where I want to be. He then reached deep into the pocket of his black baggy jeans, pulling out a wrinkled $10 bill that was rolled into a ball. He then placed it on the bar. The man then proceeded to present a Massachusetts state ID to the bartender that read a birth date of October 19, 1982. Suspecting the stocky-built individual looked a bit young for his age, Philip decided to give him the benefit of the doubt and pour him a drink anyways. The uncommon new customer ordered a Captain Morgan on the rocks and began drinking by himself, resuming his original scouring of the bar, closely examining his surroundings. The man keeps to himself, slugs the rest of his drink back rather quickly, before asking for another, paid from the leftover change made from the $10 bill. By this point, patrons had already forgotten about the odd young man's presence, and were fully engaged with their friends, laughing and enjoying themselves aloud just like any other Thursday night at Puzzle's Lounge. Just then, the short, shadowy figure, with a shaved head and scruffed goatee, slowly paced to the opposite side of the bar, placing himself now between a popcorn machine and the billiards table, where Bob Perry had been standing, watching his friends Adam Markzak and Alec Taylor as they shot a game of pool. As Adam chalked his cue, aligning his stick for the next shot, Perry suddenly felt a strange presence. That familiar feeling we get when someone is next to us, perhaps a little too close. But he didn't think too much of it, other than feeling it was a bit odd. Deciding not to pay him any mind, the silent man continued to awkwardly stand beside Bob. Eventually, when the man hadn't created any distance between the two after an uncomfortably long amount of time, Bob was only left to assume that this person must want to speak with him. With Perry's back now to the man, and just as he was about to turn to address him, a cry of sheer terror echoed throughout the bar. Bob suddenly turns to see his friend Alex Taylor, who was just mid-stride of his pool stroke, on the floor with a stout stranger standing over him, violently smashing a metal object repeatedly to the back of his skull. Perry then rotates his body, catching a quick glimpse of a blurred object now motioning toward him. With no time to react, Bob's face is met with a hot crash of steel, smashing violently into his cheekbone and splitting it in half. Stunned and with no clue of what just hit him, Perry stumbles with a forceful stream of blood exiting the right side of his face. Patrons frantically rush to the aid of the now unconscious Adam Taylor and the severely wounded Robert Perry. The short man, lurking in the corner just moments earlier, had pulled a hatchet from his hooded sweatshirt and attacked both of the men. Other customers flew toward the unidentified subject, with Adam Markzak striking him atop his short-haired scalp with the pool stick he had just been playing with in a desperate attempt to disarm the man. As the group struggled to the ground, the blood-soaked axe fell from the attacker's hand, clanging loudly across the barroom tile. Just when the customers thought they had disabled the perpetrator, he then pulls out a gun and begins to open fire, popping several rounds inside the bar, 
with a bullet screaming past bartender Philip Daggett's cheek, missing him by mere inches. The attacker then manages to get back to his feet, shooting Bob Perry once in the left shoulder. Perry falls to the floor, bleeding out now from his back and continuously from the severe axe laceration he suffered to his face just seconds earlier. Louis Rosado, a cognitively challenged patron who was visiting the bar with his mother, was shot next. The bullet entered through his back and exited out his chest. Rosado fell to the floor, desperately attempting to crawl towards his mother, but passed out as a result of shock before he could reach her. As the man now begins non-selectively shooting off multiple rounds, the first 911 call goes out from someone inside of the bar, with the sounds of gunfire drowning out the caller's voice from the background. Philip Daggett, Puzzle's loyal bartender, then shoves friends and patrons alike toward the door, doing everything in his power to help people escape. Just then, Daggett turns to see the crazed individual pointing a gun directly at his forehead. The man then pulls the trigger, but the hammer clacks back, only to make a single audible click sound. Unbeknownst to Daggett, that click would be the noise of his life having been miraculously spared. The man was out of bullets, and after realizing as much, he dashed from the bar, sprinting up North Front Street and disappearing into the darkness, before dipping off onto a side road. As police and paramedics hurried to the bloodied scene, three men clung to their lives, in an anxious panic, waiting for help to arrive. No one had any idea of why someone would do this, or more importantly, who the man was. That is, except for one woman who was present during the attack, a witness who was able to put a name to the face she vaguely remembered from high school. And we understand that a witness, a female witness in the bar has identified the suspect. She said, oh, I recognize him from high school. That's what the affidavit said, that she recognized him as a fellow named Jake from New Bedford High School, uh, apparently no longer there, uh, evidently dropped out. After police arrived just moments after the attack, a woman present at the bar that night positively identified the man dressed all in black as 18-year-old Jacob Robita of New Bedford, Massachusetts. She told police she recognized his face as they had attended high school together in the past and that he was not at all the man he portrayed himself to be via the fake ID he had used to purchase a drink. After gaining this crucial lead and the potential positive identification of the man who just randomly attacked three patrons at the local gay bar, leaving them all in critical condition, unsure if they'd survive, police headed swiftly to the home of Jacob Robita's mother on County Street, his last known documented residence. The original 911 call went out around midnight on February 2nd, 2006, and by one o'clock that same morning, Police were already showing up to the man's house that they believed committed this heinous act just an hour before. But when authorities arrived, they soon realized that they had likely just missed him. Jacob Robita's mother answered the door, startled and seemingly unaware of what was going on. She complied with police, answering all of their questions and admitting that her son was just present at the home moments before and that he was bleeding from his head. She told police that he ran out of the house before he had any time to explain, exiting the residence almost as quickly as he had shown up. Upon further investigation of the home, Police learned that not only was the identification of their suspect accurate, but that they were dealing with a much more dangerous individual than anyone could have anticipated. This episode is proudly brought to you by Wooga. Hey listeners, what if the problems we experience today plague society in the very same way 100 years ago? And the advice from back then was just as relevant today as it was in the roaring 20s and dirty 30s. Inspired by Wooga's smash hit hidden object game, June's Journey, Follow 30-something high-profile attorney and narrator Autumn Driver as she descends into the depths of her family estate at Orchid Island and into her Nana June's dusty old diary. If you're looking to take your hunger for unsolved mysteries to the next level, take a wild journey into the past by checking out the all-new podcast series called June's Journey, The Lost Diaries. Autumn shares the incredible untold stories and secrets from the life and perspective of her great-grandmother, June Parker. Set in the 1930s, she quickly discovers that the trials and tribulations of 100 years gone by are just as relevant and eerily true today. Players of June's journey will get never-before-heard hints about heroine June Parker's incredible life before she became a detective, traveling the world solving high-profile cases. So what are you waiting for? Leave the 2020s behind and get lost in the exciting, immersive, dirty 30s with Nana June. Listen to June's Journey, The Lost Diaries for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. When authorities entered Jacob Robita's bedroom, they were immediately met with anti-Semitic, homophobic, and racist writings on the walls, in personal notebooks, and on bumper stickers plastered throughout his room. Officers then came across a large stop sign, presumably stolen from somewhere in the city, as its metal jagged edges protruded from having been ripped off from its original post. 
The sign held little to no significance until officers took a closer look. They noticed that it was riddled with hand-drawn swastikas, sharpied on SWP tags, an acronym referencing Supreme White Power, Sieg Heil, a Nazi Germany marching song, and the number 14, commemorating the 14-word saying, We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. A slogan coined by racist and white supremacist David Lane, which is known as the rally cry or call to action for radical right-wing extremists. Messages and ideas of hate littered the 18-year-old's bedroom. The more they searched his living quarters, the more their concerns increased. They found 85 rounds of ammunition fit for an AK-47 rifle. They also recovered an empty knife sheath, which matched an additional knife Robita had on his person, recovered by police outside of puzzles, most likely having been lost in the bushes when he fled the scene. Among further sifting through the disarray of Aryan Nation paraphernalia and near a copy of the Nazi Party documentary, The Occult History of the Third Reich, police discovered a handwritten note addressed to Jacob's mother. Police intercepted the note before his mother was able to read it. Its contents were something to the effect of, I'm sorry about problems that I've caused, but if I had to go out, I had to go out by my own means. After a complete search of Jacob Robita's home, police seized his computer, among other various personal items belonging to their suspect. They quickly realized they had a very dangerous man on the loose, with no substantial clue of where he may be or where he may be heading. They knew they needed to act fast. After mirroring and copying the hard drive of Robita's PC, they quickly came across additional crucial evidence. His MySpace page. Jake Jekyll. As he referred to himself on the website, showcased a low-resolution digital camera profile picture of Robita, giving the middle finger with his face covered in black and white clown makeup, mimicking the signature stage gimmick of rap horrorcore group Insane Clown Posse. Jacob Robita was a self-proclaimed juggalo. For those unaware, a juggalo or juggalette is the name for a devout fan of the hip-hop group, considering any and all juggalos to be members of their, quote, family. As police scrolled further through the page, they came across lyrics in red, bold, Comic Sans font for the song called Pass the Axe by Dark Lotus, a group from the Psychopathic Records label, consisting of early ICP members, alongside Juggalo artist Blaze Ya Dead Homie and Twisted. The chorus's lyrics read as follows. Pass me something sharp and wicked, I'll pass it back. Don't worry, I'll pass it back. I'll hack you. Normally, the violent nature of these lyrics would be considered common among an angsty youth's personal music library. However, considering the circumstances surrounding what just took place at Puzzles Bar, authorities found the lyrics to be much more disturbing. Here's an excerpt from a continuation of that very song, not present on Robita's MySpace, but nonetheless, very relevant. I took the ax back to the shed where I stay, cleaned up the blood, then I sharpened the blade, waited till dark, then I ran through the hood, chopped up drunk bums like they're blocks of wood. I can't see myself stopping, if I do, I'm dead, and the only way I'm dying is if I sever my own head. The MySpace chain letter continued on with, Hey! Click on the axe and grab it. Get your hands bloody, baby. Add it to your page or put it in a comment box. Doesn't matter where you put it, just pass the fucking axe. By this point, the fate of the three men that were so viciously brutalized hung in the balance. Louis Rosado was in critical condition and was airlifted to a Boston hospital immediately after suffering a gunshot wound to his liver. Alex Taylor, also in critical condition, was suffering severe head trauma from the hatchet wounds. And Bob Perry, now in stable condition, having suffered a hatchet wound to the right side of his face, as well as a gunshot wound to his back, was left to wonder why. As with Rosado in particular, unlikely to survive, authorities began treating this investigation like a homicide. By six o'clock in the morning, just hours after visiting the Robita home, the case was handed over to the Bristol County District Attorney's Office. That same morning, New Bedford Police held a press conference, informing the public of what had happened. Authorities also issued an alert that Jacob D. Robita was indeed a wanted fugitive and was considered to be armed and dangerous. Our preliminary investigation revealed that a male walked in, a male suspect walked in, started talking to the bartender. At some point in the conversation, he asked the bartender if this was a gay bar, into which the bartender said it was. Short time later, the suspect reached into his pocket and struck an individual in the head with a hatchet. Now under extreme pressure from the community, as well as the media, reporters questioned the next move of the NBPD. The city's mayor, Scott W. Lang, was next to speak at this emergency press conference. We've got a lot of America aware of this story now and looking at the city of New Bedford and saying there's been a hate crime here and a guy went into a, into a gay bar and shot some people and possibly because they're gay. And I just wonder what your thoughts are right now. Obviously, the city is uh, extremely distressed by this. This is what uh, everyone in the city woke up to this morning. New Bedford is not the kind of place that has uh, a history of uh, hate crimes or that type of uh, tradition. In fact, this is one of the more diverse cities you'll find in the United States. People get along here very well. 
Uh, we're not going to be able, obviously, we don't tolerate this. We won't. I know the DA will prosecute this to the fullest extent of the law. I know the police are out there right now attempting to apprehend this individual. And I think the message in, in, from our community is uh, that this is not the kind of conduct that's uh, going to ever be tolerated in New Bedford. The evening following the attacks, members of all backgrounds from various neighborhoods came together for a candlelit vigil in front of the bar that had just been the scene of the barbaric hate crime. A large group of residents banded together, uniting their collective positivity in hopes that the men who were attacked would make it out of the ordeal alive. Philip Daggett, the bartender who was nearly killed the night before, spoke to the grieving New Bedford community. People like that are ignorant. They think that being gay, living a life like this, they think that's a choice. If this is a choice, are you telling me that one of these three people that are laying in a hospital bed right now in critical condition chose to be laying there right now? Do you think that any one of those people chose to live a life like this where they have to watch over their back? No. Any one of us that is standing out here right now that don't know who's even going to come driving by, do you think that we need to live a life like that? This is the way we are. This is who we are. We're people just like everybody else. We are going to stand strong. We are going to stand strong. We are going to win this. After two days of exhaustive police work and with ears to the local pavement, there was still no sign of Jacob Robita. Police reached out to friends of the suspect, gaining their whereabouts from word of mouth throughout the neighborhood. They were also able to acquire information from Robita's computer and were able to locate some of his active friends that were commenting on his MySpace page. Police searched old mill buildings, transformed into banned practice spaces, where Jacob was known to hang out, drinking and smoking weed. They also checked the homes of people that he knew personally, but still, there was nothing. Authorities became frustrated, yet remained vigilant in their search. The manhunt for 18-year-old Jacob Rabita is now in its third day. Police uh, have 20 detectives assigned solely to this case. They admit that it is getting a little frustrating, but they're confident that their hunt will pay off. Robita, police say, weighs 200 pounds, stands five feet six inches tall, and has dark hair. They say he was last seen driving a green Pontiac Grand Am, a 1999 model that has Massachusetts plates. New Bedford Police Captain Richard Spurlett spoke with the media, expressing his concerns in finding Jacob Robita. We're interviewing numerous people. And as you talk to people, they're probably giving you some leads. And at that point, we're going out and trying to find someone else. And it's just like, it's a domino type effect. And that's what we're going to keep doing until we get a break in the case. We know the whereabouts of this individual. Uh, we are not slowing up. Uh, we're going to exhaust all uh, efforts to try and find this individual. That critical break in the case would inevitably come. During their meticulous investigation, police learned of an ex-girlfriend of Robita's, 33-year-old Jennifer Reyna Bailey. Authorities eventually gathered that Robita and Bailey had met online and corresponded for quite some time via MySpace messaging. Two years prior, in 2004, Robita moved from New Bedford, Mass. to West Virginia, where Bailey was from. The two ended up living together for a brief time, but eventually broke up, and Robita moved back to his mother's house in New Bedford. This was certainly the most substantial clue authorities had at this point in their desperate search for Jacob Robita. This was the moment police became certain beyond a reasonable doubt that he was no longer in the New Bedford area and that he had very likely fled the region. False sightings had even sent police as far north as Maine, but after gaining the new information about an ex-girlfriend in West Virginia, police desperately followed up on their seemingly one and only lead, and the manhunt for Jacob D. Robita continued with newfound enthusiasm. Although the 18-year-old suspect was still on the run, some hopeful news amidst the chaos of the ongoing investigation was that Bob Perry was released from the hospital just three days after the gruesome attack. With the whole right side of his face essentially sewn back together, exhibiting a black eye and a scar that began at his temple and ended near the corner of his mustache, Perry spoke with local reporters after returning to the scene of the crime to pick up his vehicle that had still been there from the night of the attack. Here is Bob Perry, just hours after he was medically discharged. The hatchet came so fast that I don't think I had time to think, but when it hit my head, all of a sudden I said, this is something really serious that's happening here, and just about putting those thoughts together, and I heard the gunshot, and, and then it escalated to a, a bigger thing, and then I was on the floor in a pool of blood. So I, at that point, I said, I guess I'm going to die. This is, look, looks like the way it's going to end. After interviewing Bob, local newscasters interviewed one of Jacob Robita's friends. His comments only strengthened the police's urgent resolve to capture their suspect but also to err on the side of caution before putting anyone else's life at risk and trying to detain him. He's gonna be flipping out, and I know that Jake, he, has, he does have anger problems, so when they do catch him, he's not gonna, you know, he's not just gonna go, okay, cuff me, take me to jail, it's not him. He's gonna try to go out with a fight. I know Jake well enough that he's not gonna go down easy. Police were on the lookout for the 1999 Green Pontiac Grand Dam with Massachusetts plates. And while the hunt continued, they continued monitoring Robita's MySpace page, his preferred method of communication, hoping that he would eventually slip up and reveal his location, but he never did. While covertly monitoring his social media, police did notice that there were bizarre and disturbing comments flooding his page, coming in from friends and acquaintances, mostly expressing concern and worry. But some that were eerily championing him and supporting his attack at Puzzles Bar just a few nights before. Jake, I only met you once, and if you did it, good job. 
You're my fucking idol. If you really did it, tell Cherie so I can dedicate my first CD to a real killer. Signed, Nas Tay. As authorities grew increasingly agitated, having not yet located Jacob Robita, another tip came in. A tip police desperately needed. Apparently, on Thursday, February 2nd, 2006, just hours after the attack, Robita sought medical attention at a hospital in Burlington County, New Jersey, for a laceration to the head at roughly 9.30 a.m., his injuries having been the result of a pool cue that struck him over the head during the attack. Robita provided a fake name to hospital personnel and claimed that he was homeless. After his release from the hospital, the nurse that treated Jacob saw his face on the news a day later. She was absolutely stunned, recognizing that the man she had just treated was a wanted criminal. Hospital employees then notified police, informing them of his last known whereabouts. Police were now closing in on Jacob Robita. Having last been seen in New Jersey, his newly confirmed location also contributed to the lead that he was potentially heading to West Virginia, to Jennifer Bailey's house. And that theory would soon turn out to be true. Later on that same evening, Jacob Robita showed up at the Amandaville apartment complex in St. Albans, West Virginia, sometime between 7 and 9 o'clock p.m. The same building that Robita and Bailey once shared together back in 2004. Robita evidently had not been in recent contact with Bailey, because after showing up at their former apartment, he had not realized that Jennifer no longer lived there. After discovering the news, Robita desperately scrambled for a plan and would eventually seek the help of an old neighbor that he remembered who happened to still live in the apartment complex. The friendly neighbor, surprised to see Jacob and unaware that she was speaking with a fugitive on the run, decided to assist the 18-year-old. The neighbor happened to know where Jennifer had moved to, a town called Charleston, West Virginia, roughly 13 miles away. After some convincing, the neighbor agreed to take Jacob to Jennifer's new residence. Upon arriving, Jennifer was not pleased to see Jacob one bit. Bailey told Robita to leave after he begged her to let him stay the night, and after several refusals, Jennifer eventually slammed the door behind her and went inside. The kind-hearted neighbor, who Jacob knew from years past, didn't have the heart to leave a familiar face out in the cold that night. Surely, under the impression that this was simply a couple that was having relationship issues, the neighbor allowed Robita to spend the night at their apartment, completely oblivious to the fact that she would be harboring an extremely violent and unpredictable outlaw. Jennifer Bailey called a friend that night, just after Jacob left her home, but that friend never answered. She left a voicemail expressing her concerns, stating something to the effect of, Hey, he wants me to stay here. I just saw him on the news. He committed a murder, and I don't want him staying here. The following hours of Friday, February 3rd, 2006, are still in question with regard to Robita's exact movements and specific whereabouts early on in the day. That is, until 8 p.m. came around. It's still unknown if Jennifer Bailey left with Robita on her own accord or if she was forced to accompany him against her will. What we do know is that she did indeed get in the Green Pontiac Grand Dam with Jacob, fully aware of the events that took place in New Bedford. We also know that at some point past 8 o'clock, Bailey left one of her three children with her mother, stating that she was going out with some friends for a belated birthday celebration that had actually passed a week before. Her two other children were staying with the father at the time. Bailey is later recorded withdrawing $500 from an ATM and was also seen on video surveillance purchasing groceries with Robita. Police would later suggest that these casual acts certainly did not seem those of one under duress or in fear for their life, leaving authorities to believe that perhaps Jennifer Bailey was a potential accomplice rather than a hostage. Jennifer's father, Ronnie Dunlap, however, refuses to believe that his daughter would leave willingly with such a dangerous and deranged criminal, especially after learning of what he had done back east. Nevertheless, the two were now on the run as a pair. Robita had a cash reserve of a mere $350 to fund his seemingly aimless escape, funds that he'd earned back home as payment from a construction job that he had worked with his father. By the time local police showed up at Jennifer Bailey's apartment in West Virginia, they were already too late. One step ahead of authorities, Jacob Robita and his new passenger, ex-girlfriend Jennifer Raina Bailey, began to drive west overnight. The following afternoon at 2.30 p.m. on February 4, 2006, roughly 11 hours away from Jennifer's home in Charleston, West Virginia, the two outlaws were spotted in Gasville, Arkansas. Officer Jim Sell proceeded to pull over a 1999 Pontiac Grand Dam with out-of-state license plates during a routine traffic stop. Unaware that there was an alert out on a vehicle matching the very description of this one at the time, Officer Sell walked up and approached the driver's side door, just like the countless times he had done before on any other day on the job. Robita was eventually asked to exit the vehicle. He seemingly complied, but only seconds later brandished a handgun as soon as he stepped out of the car. Robita immediately fired three shots at Officer Sell, striking him once in the arm, once in the neck, and once in the head. Mary Ann Hoyne, the manager of the Brass Door Motel at the time, heard gunshots from inside of the building as Robita's vehicle had pulled over in the business's parking lot. Upon rushing to the window, she saw a police cruiser with its lights on and a body laying in the street. 
Mary immediately dialed 911 with her eyes glued to the scene, staring cautiously through the window. Before hanging up the phone, she noticed a green Pontiac quickly circle back through the parking lot, near where Officer Jim Sell was lying. The driver quickly retrieved something off the ground, and then abruptly sped off. Some witnesses claimed that Robita had discarded his weapon at the scene after shooting Jim Sell, and decided to come back to recover the 9mm handgun. Police would later confirm, however, that Robita actually came back to retrieve his identification that Officer Sell had collected from Jacob just moments before he shot him. Police were able to identify Robita's general location after the 911 call from the motel's manager. He was heading east on Highway 62. Police hurried to set up several roadblocks, but to no avail. Robita was able to successfully maneuver past some of them and barreled directly through or over others, blowing through them at a high rate of speed. He continued down Arkansas State Highway 201 with his ex-girlfriend at his side. But authorities would eventually get ahead of the suspect's vehicle and were able to lay spike strips in his projected path. As Robita approached, officers fired at the Pontiac twice with their shotguns, while Jacob drove over the top of the sharp strips as he flew by. He somehow managed to turn onto Highway 5, where he led police on a continued reckless chase for roughly 16 miles, driving at speeds of up to 90 miles per hour, before the whole thing would abruptly come to an end in Norfolk, Arkansas. Robita's vehicle lost control when the Pontiac's two shredded tires finally gave way, his vehicle now completely disabled from the sharp nail-like bed of prongs police threw out in front of him on the road miles earlier. As the green Pontiac pirouetted into a near full 180-degree rotation, Robita's car slammed into two parked vehicles, coming to an abrupt standstill. At last, Jacob Robita and Jennifer Bailey were now facing the direction of the very officers they had their backs to for the entirety of their attempted yet failed escape. This was it. It was the end of the road. Jennifer knew it, and so did Jacob. But Robita's friend that appeared on the news a few days prior was right. Jacob wouldn't be going down without a fight. He called it. He knew his friend all too well. The once romantically involved couple were then seen by witnesses hugging each other, embracing one another several times. As officers reinforced their perimeter, the sirens gradually piercing louder as more cruisers approached. From the now useless and total 1999 Grand Am, surrounded by police, Robita began to open fire. After discharging multiple rounds indiscriminately in the vast vicinity of gathering law enforcement, he then leans over and embraces Jennifer Bailey once more, but for the very last time. He raises the gun to the side of his ex-girlfriend's head, pulls the trigger, and kills Jennifer Raina Bailey instantly. After murdering his former companion and unloading multiple rounds directed toward police, Robita gave up. He had no hope left. There was no way he'd make it out of this alive. And in that moment, decided to turn the gun on himself, firing the final round that he'd ever let fly directly into the right side of his own temple. After shooting himself, Jacob Robita was immediately struck by another bullet, this one coming from police. It hit him in the head as well. And this just into CNN, Arkansas State Police say Jacob Robita is in custody. You may recall he was wanted in connection with an attack at a gay bar in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He has been apprehended in the state of Arkansas after a shootout with police, we are told. We will, of course, bring you more details, but this attack occurred uh, just two nights ago. That would be Thursday night. Uh, apparently, Robita reportedly uh, attacked patrons at a gay bar, not only with a gun, but with a hatchet. Uh, he has been wanted on three counts of attempted murder. We're just learning today that one of the victims is still in critical condition. He had uh, been seen driving a green Pontiac Grand Am. But we are told now that after a shootout with police in the state of Arkansas, 18-year-old Jacob Robita, according to the Associated Press, has been picked up and is in custody in connection with this attack at the gay bar in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Jacob Robita was taken into custody and then quickly rushed to a Springfield, Missouri hospital, still alive but in critical condition. A condition similar to that of the two men still clinging to their lives some 1,400 miles east. But Jacob would not survive his injuries. He was ultimately pronounced dead the next morning at 3.38 a.m. on Sunday, February 5th, 2006. Arkansas State Police addressed the media following the incident. Rubita fired a handgun, killing Officer Sell. Rubita raised a handgun to the head of Bailey, fired, and it's believed that she was killed instantly. Although an alert had gone out nationwide to all police departments across the entire United States, Arkansas State Police Captain G.B. Harp admitted to ignoring the warning never notifying his on-duty officers of the description of Jacob Robita's vehicle, a decision that very well may have cost Jim Sell his life. It's just one of those situations that, uh, you know, it happens time and time again, and sometimes we don't take them as serious as we need to. Fortunately, no other police officers were injured, that is, with the exception of Officer Jim Sell, the 63-year-old retired captain, a man that chose to still serve his community part-time who just happened to come across Jacob Robita that day in Gasville. The complete chance encounter that would result in the senseless and tragic murder of the innocent man. It was originally reported by the media that Jacob Robita died as a result of a fatal gunshot wound to his head from police during the standoff. 
However, an autopsy and forensic testing would later conclude that the fatal round was in fact from Robita's own 9mm Ruger handgun. The same bullet type was found to be identical to that of the ammunition which was used to kill his ex-girlfriend, Jennifer Bailey. After further search of the vehicle, police would discover a cache of weapons, including a 20-gauge shotgun and another rifle, all located in the trunk of the car. Authorities also found cans of soda, bread, potato chips, instant soups, and two small bags of clothing, his and hers. They also recovered $187 cash off Robita's person, the remaining funds of the original $350 that he started out with. Yet after so much tragedy, after all of the havoc that had been wreaked in only a matter of four days, and after multiple lives were senselessly lost, the question still remains of why, and who was Jacob Robita truly, and what would compel him to commit such a vicious hate crime on innocent patrons at a friendly neighborhood bar, before fleeing to Arkansas with his estranged girlfriend, only to result in the murder of a police officer? Would he then kill her and himself? How does someone form and live by ideas of such extreme hatred by the age of 18? Even by the age of 14, Jacob Robita was seen in photos pictured in sleeveless tank tops with an iron cross tattoo on his right shoulder, the symbol used as the highest German military decoration for bravery. But Jacob wasn't brave. He was a coward, a confused individual who couldn't even get the character right on his MySpace when he accidentally chose the protagonist of Jekyll, when he certainly meant to identify with a more sinister and dark hide. He chose not to face the repercussions of his unconscionable actions, so he took his own life, but not before taking the lives of several others. He wasn't courageous, and he damn sure wasn't a soldier. So how does an 18-year-old American kid from an inner city wind up with a swastika tattoo on his hand at such a young age? And what influences someone to subscribe to these ideas? Friends of Jacob might be the closest insight that we have as to who this deranged young man actually was. See, I'm surprised it happened as low-key as it did. I thought it would have been more, more bang to it because he was not going to jail. Are you at all <laughs> ashamed of what he did? Not at all. I mean, I don't like what he did. I don't think he was right for doing what he did, but I definitely won't turn my back on him for what he did because he is my friend. Jacob was certainly an outcast, but it's apparent that this didn't mean he was without friends. He did have people that cared about him, and according to those that knew him personally, he sought out this type of ostracization and actively reveled in being a reject. His circle of close friends, mostly all self-proclaimed juggalos and juggalettes, were still under a close microscope by police, even after the tragedy ended. Authorities were investigating who may have known what, and if anyone may have contributed or assisted Jacob Robita in any way. The hip-hop horrorcore group Insane Clown Posse would also come under extreme scrutiny after the puzzles attack, specifically after police learned the extreme similarities to the contents of the group's lyrics and what Jacob had done that night at the bar. ICP would go on record to denounce the actions of Jacob Robita, reaffirming that the content of the group's material is for the sole purpose of entertainment and that it should never be taken literally. A few days after Jacob Robita's cross-country domestic terrorist attack, ICP released a statement addressing the events as well as the allegations made in regard to the influence of their music on these crimes. On February 7, 2006, ICP's manager at the time, Alex Abbas, said, quote, Today, I'd like to speak out about the incident which took place in New Bedford, Mass. First, I'd like to say that we'd like to extend our condolences to the victims and their families in this tragedy. Our prayers are with you. And with that said, I would now like to address the whole issue. This guy had problems. Anyone going into a bar and swinging an axe and shooting a gun would have to realize that they would get caught and or get killed and that this would be the last action they took for the rest of their lives and would clearly have to be insane and out of their mind to do this. In my opinion, the perpetrator of this crime committed these acts not because he was a juggalo, but because he was a neo-Nazi. He subscribed to an ideology of racism and bigotry and was quite clearly, in my opinion, out of his mind. Anyone that knows anything at all about juggalos knows that in no way, shape, or form would we ever approve of this type of bullshit behavior. Any tragedy even slightly connected to the presumed influence of heavy metal, rap, or vulgar music in general, especially when the perpetrator has expressed an affinity for the artist in question, almost always becomes a scapegoat when looking for someone or something to blame. And though this may be the low-hanging fruit, the reaching and latching from a confused community, or country for that matter, desperately seeking an answer to why from the ground level. But it's never that simple. While ICP's music is unquestionably violent in nature, most would agree that no one in their right mind would take the lyrics of a song entitled Pass the Axe, literally. No sane person would act out the words of a song, verbatim, that was consistent with themes of bludgeoning innocent people with a hatchet. But that's exactly what Jacob did. When unpacking the details of a tragedy like this, it's important to speak to the people closest to where these crimes happened in order to get a true perspective on the events that took place. In this case, the people that grew up with and around someone like Jacob Robita. We were able to speak with one of those people 15 years after the tragedy. A man named Eric Johnson, who neither the media nor police ever spoke with. 
a man who had a violent encounter with Jacob Robita just a few months before the bar attack on North Front Street in New Bedford. His story and interaction with Robita shortly before the events of that February in 2006 indicated that Eric might well have narrowly escaped death himself. When I was about maybe 19, in my early 20s, um, I encountered uh, someone who we now know as Jake Rabita. I was with a friend at the New Bedford High Bonfire, which is in Buttonwood Park. And, you know, I had seen him through friends of friends before and stuff like that, but never exactly knew who he was. And we were in the park, you know, just shooting the shit, laughing, walking around. And uh, I hear this kid go, hey, faggot, nice tight jeans. You know what I mean? And I'm like, okay, so I'm a cocky little shit then. So I uh, turn around and I look at him, like laughing this dude off, like you're just a bigoted asshole. We don't really give a fuck what you say about us. We know who we are. So it's about a half hour later and I'm talking to Bruce and this girl, Bethany. And all of a sudden I get a tap on my shoulder. I turn and I'm sucker punched directly in my right eye. And uh, it's probably one of the only times, you know, I bounce downtown at the bar. I do a lot of different things. But it's, it's, it's one of the only times I've really been like knocked out for a second by a human being. It's lame, but he caught me good with the sucker. I, I fully didn't see it coming. So I uh, instantly got up. I was only out for a couple seconds. And I look at the crowd of people, and they're all looking at me. And I said, which way did he go? And the, uh, the crowd parts and, and just points. And I just see him running. He's like maybe 300 feet away. And I start closing on him. He's got this big trench coat on. And I run after him. And I threw him to the ground. And I ran up. And I kicked him as hard as I could in the face. He started bleeding a little right over here. And just as I did that, and I'm like starting to like, like let's go, man. All of a sudden, this New Bedford cop comes out of nowhere. And he just spears me to the ground. And I like roll with him. And I stand up. And he's like, you start bites, you start bites. And I'm like, listen, man, like, look at my face right now. I just got sucker punched by this dude who you just let go because he took off as soon as the cops speared me. And he takes off running. You know what I mean? The cops like yelling at me. And I'm like, listen, like you're an asshole telling him off. He's all, you need an ambulance, buddy? And I was like, I don't need a fucking ambulance, you know? And then he's all, oh, you want to come with me? Come on. What's your name? What's your ID number? You know, like completely harassing me like I did something and defending myself. I just looked at him and he's like getting ready to like, you know, be a cop. He's going to he's going to arrest me, do whatever he's going to do. I just started running and I ran home to my buddy's house, which was on Florence Street down from Buttonwood. And I just hid in the closet. <laughs> you know, it was like a young kid. I was kind of shook. That night, man, uh, I had like three of this kids at Jake Rabita's friends messaging me. And they're all, oh, yeah, you know, uh, we're going to get you all this. And, uh, you know, threatening violence with hatchets, you know, and uh you know, I, I don't like uh, say that music affects people and stuff like that, but they were all juggalos and uh, the hatchet was his main choice for uh, a threat to me. It is absolutely chilling to hear that Jacob Robita undoubtedly was ramping up for some act of serious violence. It's also clear that he had some strange affinity with his hatchet, an obsession, if you will, and that he was clearly hungry to use it. This only lends to the confirmation that the attack on puzzles was no random occurrence at all. It's probably a good solid three months of harassment right up until the attack at Puzzles on uh, North Front Street, where he went in and did what he did to those poor people. It was just, you know, a long three months of me looking over my shoulder, looking for, I won't say the people's names, but, you know, the, these people who are also threatening me with him, which stopped as soon as he did that, you know. And uh, one of them, one of the kids who threatened me actually hit me up years later because I made a post about this and told me, take it down, it's not disrespectful and all that. I'm like, dude, like, what he did was disrespectful. Like, how can you defend him? And the dude's like, you'll get yours. And I was like, you know, I'll piss on his grave. I really don't give a fuck. I'll piss on that dude's grave. Eric Johnson received several threats via MySpace messages, with Jacob Robita threatening to find him, telling him he'd be waiting for him at the Wamsutta band spaces when he'd be walking home at night. Johnson recalls having to look over his shoulder, recounting the times he would walk to his girlfriend's house in fear that he would be jumped. The harassment of Eric Johnson, appointed by Jacob Robita himself and several of his closest friends, three months following their physical scuffle in the park, is extreme to say the least. The fact that Robita and his crew dedicated so much energy and time trying to find Johnson threatening to kill him with a hatchet nonetheless, shows just how deranged he truly was. A high school scrum, whatever the motivation behind the fight may be, would usually be brushed off, over with, and forgotten about almost as quickly as it started. But not for Jacob Robita. He sought revenge on anyone that had wronged him, and was known to have extreme anger problems, according to his friends and family. But no one could ever anticipate these types of hateful and violent actions, escalating to murder. Luckily, Johnson was able to evade Robita, right up until that night at Puzzle's Bar when he decided to take his anger out on someone else. Living under those threats and with that shit and then uh, seeing what he did and how it all unfolded, I always look back at it as one of those pivotal points in my life where without a reason of a doubt, he could have fucking killed me. I mean, honestly, obviously, at that point, he could have killed anybody he wanted, you know what I mean? Because nobody expected him to do what he did. Eric Johnson, along with many others in the New Bedford community, are still left unsure as to why anyone would go to such lengths to hurt this many people in such a gruesome way. But one thing Eric is sure of, however, is that he very well could have been listed among the names of the victims killed in the midst of Jacob Robita's reign of terror. I just remember him being this ignorant, cocky, Nazi-loving asshole with a swastika tattoo on his hand, you know? And, like, I can remember his face clear as day. It's always fucked me up. He did that to those people, and it's just a crazy thing, and I always look back on it and... 
think how, how shit could have been different. Theories would eventually emerge, suggesting that Robita had perhaps been planning on reaching home base of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan in Harrison, Arkansas, which was located only 40 minutes from his final standoff with police. Although law enforcement would later debunk this theory, Glenn Miller, well-known racist in the white freedom power movement, gave his thoughts when asked about Jacob Robita's potential involvement with the KKK. I approve. Hell, I'd like to see that on TV every hour. Glenn Miller would later be found guilty himself for killing three people in a separate 2014 hate-fueled attack against Jews at a community center in Overland Park, Kansas. Miller was sentenced to death and is currently on death row. In this very special episode, we had the pleasure of speaking with not one, but three individuals who were extremely close to this case. Two of those people are Tammy Gold and David Pavlosky, the creators of the documentary Puzzles When Hate Came to Town, an independent film created by the two filmmakers surrounding these tragic events in 2006. Tammy has been a filmmaker for over 30 years and has won achievements such as the Audience Award at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2004 for her documentary Every Mother's Son a film about the death of Amadou Diallo, who was killed by New York City police in 1999 after reaching for his wallet. Needless to say, the Invisible Choir podcast team is extremely grateful to have been given the opportunity to conduct this exclusive interview. We were intrigued to hear their firsthand perspective of what they had learned on the ground in New Bedford, Massachusetts, as the events were actually unfolding. New Bedford, the access David and I had in New Bedford was very much around working class people. And the LGBT community that we met what were mostly people from the working class. And the people who were Jake's friends equally were from the working class. What happened with puzzles and the attack at the bar is that Jake was lost in the high school, that Jake was lost in the junior high school, and that Jake's friends equally were lost, and that they became, and in his case, very specifically, a bully, and that there was no way to intervene, that there was no structure to really deeply intervene. We asked Tammy and David about the changes they had seen occur as an outcome of this tragedy, particularly in the LGBTQ community in New Bedford. There was, you know, there was a struggle around marriage equality before we got there. There was a struggle around civil rights and access to good education. So there was a lot of civil liberties and civil rights movements going on. And so what developed is something called Welcoming Schools. And that's a project that specifically has a vision of bringing LGBT questions, curriculum into the high schools. But the reason why it's so important is because the attack became a catalyst to say, we have to talk to our young people. We cannot be complacent. The Welcoming Schools project and implementation was the best outcome of the crisis that happened at the Puzzles Bar with the homophobic attack. We also asked David Pavlosky what his personal thoughts were on how Jacob Robita arrived at subscribing to such extreme ideologies of violence and hate. So there was a point when Jake was actually trying on a lot of different kind of clothing and a different kind of music and trying to be accepted. And I think also a part of his experience growing up in high school was being bullied himself. And his friend Jared talked about how when they adopted the Nazi sign, it was a way of fending other people off. So in my opinion, I think what happened with Jake was early on wearing the, the tough clothes, the all black and seeking a way to prevent people from bullying him. He found access to power on a lower level as he used the Internet to access information. He found a lot of powerful symbols and a lot of powerful research in, you know, Nazism. We even know in America now, after recent political elections, we're threatened by autocracy in this country, not democracy, but autocracy. And I think that that also leads to the connection of white supremacy, which is about power and dominance, where one person can lead and everyone else follows. So Jake found this power in leading. And I looked at his friends as being followers, right? Because you only need one leader. And I think that Jake enacted a lot of things that his followers themselves wouldn't do. But they found a sense of family in following him. And they found connection as a family. Because as we interviewed Jake's friends, I didn't feel that they had a lot of connection to their own families the families that they were born into. Both David and Tammy reflected on perhaps their largest mutual takeaway in creating the film, having seen firsthand the shared desperation and desire for human connection and acceptance. Ironically, these two groups of outcasts, though nothing alike, found a camaraderie within their respective circles. Fundamentally, everyone wants family and love. And that's what I learned in New Bedford. And that's what I learned about the people who patronized puzzles and about Jake and his friends. And in both cases, they created alternative families. And so there's a great parallel between one group who's gay and lesbian, who really want to do fundraising, different projects to help the community, both the gay and lesbian community, but also the wider community. And then you have another group that wants family and they find family among their own. And in this case, 
young white teenagers. And in that context, both families, one is really healthy and one is really not healthy. He was attracted to a community which became a family that in fact was grounded in alienation, in celebrating their alienation, and in hating the other. It's a shame that Jake Robita's ignorance and hate would never allow him to accept those outside of his circle. And it's a shame that in 2006, when we'd like to think that we've come so far in regards to racism and homophobia as a society, that in a certain sense, we have not. And that there are Jake Robitas in pockets of nearly every American city to this very day. He chose a hatchet to attack Bob Perry. That wasn't a random thing that just happened. He made choices. He educated himself. He possessed guns. He possessed many rounds of bullets. And he really self-educated himself to move forward in the way that he proceeded. And it emanated in this attack. If you get the chance, please check out the film Puzzles When Hate Came to Town by David Pavlosky and Tammy Gold. And a special thank you to both of them for being gracious with their time and perspective on this truly horrific case. Puzzles When Hate Came to Town is distributed by New Day Films. And you can go to the website just by going to newdayfilms.com. Puzzles would soon close after the attack in 2006 and was reopened under the name Rainbow's End. Unfortunately, the Rainbow's End bar was only open for a brief period and the venue would soon shut its doors for good. All three men that were violently attacked at Puzzles that February night in 2006 remarkably survived. And though they did not succumb to their physical injuries, they will forever carry the emotional and traumatic burden of what happened to them on that night. We may never know why Jacob Robita did what he did. What we do know is that two innocent victims lost their lives, and three other men almost met the same fate. A poor kid from a broken family in an extremely diverse and multicultural city like New Bedford, Massachusetts, has been the outline for so many success stories to come out of the South Coast New England city. Stories completely opposite of Jacob Robita's. To say that he was a mere product of his environment would simply be inaccurate. Perhaps it is much simpler than that. That some people at the core, against the very grains of community, family, and friends, are inherently evil and hell-bent on causing maximum destruction at whatever cost necessary. Though New Bedford residents would certainly opt to erase this man from their city's history altogether, they know that they cannot. What they have done instead is become stronger as a city somehow becoming tougher than this Massachusetts whaling town already was, before Jacob Robita terrorized their streets. And while Robert Perry survived both the gunshot wound and the hatchet laceration to his face, he would sadly pass away 12 years later on June 9, 2018, after a long and arduous battle with brain cancer. He was only 65 years old. Here is one of the last things that Bob would ever say to the media, selflessly wishing that he could have spoken to Jacob Robita himself in an attempt to in some way help him. And what did we do wrong here? Did, did you have a mental illness? Was it drugs? Uh, will we ever know? And I, I wish Jacob, uh, I, the world is a better place that Jacob is not here, but I wanted to hear Jacob speak and I never did.